if you look at the trends, especially in the last year, the rural markets are, are doing better than a lot of the um, a lot of the the metro markets. A lot of that it, it goes into regulation, like of just cities banning short term rentals completely. Uh, right. The rural markets are rural mountain markets are doing really, really, really well right now, and I see that continuing in the next like five years. You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Carrie Lutz. Hey, we're in the first week of September. Hard to believe time flying by uh rates keep going up will they keep going higher or will the fed capitulate that always is the question when you're talking about higher rates you got to look at the real estate market is that going to cause a crash is it going to cause a correction maybe not a crash but softness in the market even in places like florida where the market is still really strong i mean my neighbor's house is going in three days still but nonetheless, uh, sales are down, but inventory is down. With us, expert on the topic, Alex Jarba. Alex, you've been doing short-term vacation rentals for seven years now. So probably what's going on in the marketplace isn't a surprise to you. How many units are you currently uh, running out there? Yeah, so we have 16 luxury units, and then we're in the process of purchasing a $20 million, I call it like a micro resort, essentially here as well. Yep. Oh, very cool. Hey, so what do you see as the pitfalls, especially with higher rates? Um, I mean, in theory, as long as the demand is still there, you're still getting uh, IRRs 30 40%, right? So... So what yeah, we just we just underwrote a deal on that. Yeah, we we're we we're just underwriting a deal yesterday with a partner. I was like, those numbers don't look real. Like people aren't gonna believe them and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, but but hey, but you have to understand it's not you know, the audience, you 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 out there, our our community, you have to understand that running a luxury rental, vacation rental is not like renting out a home or a condo. On an annual basis, uh, there's a lot of active management that takes place. There's cleaning required. There's restocking because uh, your towels, you know, your glassware, your silverware disappears over time. All these things, and uh, keeping it at the right standard. Because, right, Alex, you're a luxury vacation rental. People uh, don't expect a ring around the bathtub, do they? Right. <laughs> So, so really, to get an IRR, it's more akin to what you might in a small business as opposed to real estate. But um, the vacation, short-term vacation rental market is rumored to be hitting saturation. What's your experience with that? Yeah, so that the Airbnb bust thing that sort of uh, that became popular. That term hashtag Airbnb bust. Uh, had become popular in the last like six to eight months. I'm a writer for big, I'm the main short term rental vacation rental writer for bigger pockets. And um, I, I'm pretty sure that came from one of my peers. And I'd for, Forbes had picked it up and then it just, mm -hmm. it, it just went crazy. And, and it's exactly what you just said. It's, it's more like a business. And that's what I've coached over 5,000 students in vacation rentals in the last couple of years, um, just through group coaching settings and whatnot. And, the, the exactly what you said that you have to treat it like a business the people that it, it's like a combination of like people are saying it's saturated but those are the same people that sort of got into short-term rentals when they or they got into they call them airbnbs they they just they bought a property because the rates were low they threw it on airbnb and they're like okay i'm good to go like i'm done and what's evolved in the last i would say six months is and it, it started to happen before there but it's the people who are utilizing the strategies that i'm going to be talking about now now is are doing way better than than the people that are just like throwing up a property on Airbnb. Um, the biggest thing is just going multi-platform. So like when someone tells you I'm I'm in Airbnbs, that, that's not necessarily the right thing to say. I like to think that I'm in hospitality. Exactly what you said. It's like I'm mm -hmm. I'm in vacation rentals for sure. But like when I first started, there were no vacation rental Airbnb books out there. I I leaned very heavily on like hospitality textbooks that were like. 
taught in universities and whatnot that I would just purchase on Amazon. Sure. And um, the just like any other business, you're building an email list, but you're also going multi-platform. So Airbnb, VRBO, Booking.com, Expedia, and there's like two, three, Expedia owns 200 channels under them. And I look at those as more of marketing arms to my business compared to just where my properties live at. Um, those platforms are always going to be a part of my business, but the eventual goal is to get the guests' contact info. And the way we do that is we we use a service called StayFi, which is a little disk that plugs into the back of your router and it creates a landing page for your internet. And um, just like you're going to Starbucks, you're going to the airport, uh, like you have to put your email address in to get access to the internet. Same idea, except it's branded to your company. Um, and then we collect everyone's, so like we have luxury rentals that can sleep up to 16, 18 people. Uh, outside of just getting the guest's email address, we get everyone that's staying with us and then we remarket to them through a direct booking site. Right. Um, direct bookings is sort of where the future of short-term rentals is going anyways. And it's interesting because it's practically going full circle because back in the day before Airbnb VRBO existed, mm -hmm. you had to pick up a phone to book a vacation rental. So it's, it's gone full circle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. So, uh, so obtaining your client's info, very important because when you use the platforms, whether it's Airbnb or VRBO or one of the clones out there, you don't get that. It's kind of like the same thing, putting your uh, your podcast up on YouTube. You know people are watching it, listening to it, but you don't know who they are because YouTube, VRBO, Airbnb, consider them to be uh, their clients, not yours. So you manage to get it by various means, and then you create a mailing list. And then I guess if, if it's a little quiet you do a special right different times of the year. yeah we send seasonal emails leading into our high season and whatnot or what if it's summer's coming up sending emails a month or two before and whatnot just to say uh, top of mind yep but like the the uh person renting and doing the short-term rental there's a certain measure of protection that they feel they get from airbnb and vrbo if they're not satisfied how do you uh, bypass their concerns there? How do you overcome them? Yeah, by by taking them off of the platform. So like they're, all the guests that we have stayed with us initially have come from the platform. So that's the key there is to make sure that they have a good experience with us when they're coming from, say, if it's an Airbnb guest. Um, there's nothing against uh, another, like um, people have said, like I've said that before about like taking them off the platforms. There's nothing against terms of service of capturing their info and remarketing to them after they've stayed with you. It's against their. It's against terms of service if they're trying to book with you initially and you're like, hey, here's my direct booking website. Long. Just do with it. That, that's a no no. Um, but most of the people that are stay, all the people that are staying with us have had a good experience. Who are booking with us again um, have already stayed with us through one of the OTAs, the online travel agencies and they've already had a good experience with us so it's it's a very easy sell especially send an email a seasonal email out that's like hey you can save on uh your service fees or at least partially save on your service fees if you book directly with us and like i said they've already had a good experience with us hopefully they've had a good experience um where it's a it's a pretty easy transition to get them to book with us okay so i can see that and uh and you're totally compliant which is important all right so uh going direct going the uh, different platforms so you on every platform out there uh, that exists for short-term rentals yeah and i mean beyond short-term rentals like and that's the other trend that's happened um is what i said like you're in hospitality because marriott has their own platform now for like villas right. they're, they're on the, the luxury side booking.com obviously got into the business um, I, I forgot when, but the, they really ramped up their platform on the vacation rental side. Same thing with mm -hmm. Expedia. I mean, Expedia was never in it. So all these bigger players are getting into it, especially seeing Marriott. Marriott was like sort of the aha moment for me a couple of years back. Um, and right. just the amount of work that they've put behind that. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really interesting to see that evolve. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, so you got choices. You're not just locked in, uh, but to uh, how to how to customer complaints get handled here, Alex? In terms of on the direct booking side, or just yeah, the, when you directly book them yourself, yeah. Right. So yes. the the biggest thing is the insurance piece. Is like Airbnb, VRBO, the online traveling cheese. They they cover. They have a, a blanket insurance policy, 
Um, and there are companies out there, I mean, I can plug a couple right now, like Safely and Superhog that essentially offer, not essentially, they offer the exact insurance that Airbnb VRBO uses. Um, right. So that that's number one. Other customer complaints, I mean, it just goes directly through the platform. So like um, we use a property management software called Hostaway. There's 20, 30 different softwares out right. there, just like any other, if you're multifamily or whatever, property there's some management. property yeah. management softwares, yeah. Um, all, all of those complaints or all those things are fed through either through a phone number or through um, the direct booking site or through email. And then it's fed through our property management software, which is then handled with, with our team. Gotcha. All right. Well, that sounds interesting. So, uh, hey, where are the best markets to be buying now? I like to invest in mountain markets that aren't ski resorts, uh, like ski resort areas. So they, the mountain markets tend to be a little bit less seasonal. You're looking at the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Spokey Mountains. I want to do something on the West Coast next year, or at least a, a larger project on the West Coast. Um, but right now I'm tied to like the the mountain markets where they're, they're not historically known as like ski resorts because they tend to be a little bit less seasonal. Cabin in the woods in the winter is pretty picturesque, but you also have your high season summer and fall. Um, so I, I love mountain markets. Um, and there's hundreds of these pocket markets throughout the whole country. Um, it's like a lot of times there's smaller towns that are a little bit more rural. If you look at the trends, especially in the last year, the rural markets are, are doing better than a lot of the um, a lot of the the metro markets. A lot of that it, it goes into regulation, like of just cities banning short term rentals completely. Uh, right. but the rural markets are rural mountain markets are doing really, really, really well right now. And I see that continuing in the next like five years and whatnot. So uh, a unit in a rural market, uh, how much would it cost to acquire and what kind of uh, what kind of cash flow can you get on it? Yeah. So let's talk about my first one. So um, my very first real estate uh, project slash own, like own, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a licensed real estate agent here. I don't practice anymore, but mm -hmm. my very first real estate property that I owned was an 800 square foot A-frame that was a ground up development from nothing. Um, which apparently is not normal to to have your first investment be a ground up development, but right. that very that very first one that we built uh, six seven years ago now, um, that one cash flows after debt service and everything. Last year it cash flowed fifty four thousand um, dollars. So that's just one, and then we we ended up building multiple ones of the, like almost practically the same house. Um, so I mean the cash flows are absolutely ridiculous. How much did it cost? How much did that cost to buy, or how much would yeah, you buy now? Prior to prior to COVID, uh, the the construction cost, so I'd tack like thirty to forty percent to the numbers that I'm about to say right now. Um, it all in land cost. We did get a, a second home construction loan to build that. That was only ten percent down out of pocket. It was about forty forty five grand out of pocket. Uh, total, it was about two hundred fifty grand um, with furnishing, land, and everything to build that first one. Wow. Um, so technically, my cash on cash, if you if you look at the money I invested. Um, has been a hundred percent. I mean, technically infinite at this point, but it, it's over a hundred percent every uh, after that first year. Yeah, very cool. All right, yeah. hey, how do you uh, find management to keep these places clean and uh, clean and shining? Yeah, so the the biggest thing was uh, I, I had the management company for the first seven years I did this so up until very recently, um, and the most important piece to that is finding a vacation rental cleaning company that you can grow with. Um, a company yeah. that that specifically specializes in vacation rentals, not just like cleaning someone's house because they need to be there at a specific time and be out in a specific time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's step number one is that um, because that the the cleaning company can also handle your maintenance or not your maintenance, your inventory and whatnot, which which they right. did for me. And then um, having like a, just a maintenance person and just making sure that those people can talk to each other just through their system. So another side to that is also have virtual assistants like overseas assistants that are ex Marriott Airbnb employees that are used to dealing with guests on a regular basis. Um, and if I can't answer a question or whatnot, like I'm not, I'm not in the day to day when it comes to the management, um, but the virtual assistants handle all the messaging. If there's something damaged, usually the the uh, cleaners are the first boots on the ground to see if something is damaged. So they're either reaching out to the maintenance person or they're reaching out to the virtual assistant if it's something like really serious. Yeah. Okay. That's the biggest concern often is the management and the cleaning services. That's where my friends have said they've had yeah. issues. So yeah. Cleaning services, like I said, a cleaning service that you can grow with, That that's very important. Right. Yeah. All right. Hey, well, I think we got some good insight here. We'll have you back on again to go more in depth. 
maybe show us a couple of your units and uh, oh, yeah, show us uh, some spreadsheets because we love numbers on this show. Hey, uh, if you got a question for Alex or myself, shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. The link to Alex's site is in the show notes to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Just tell us your site, Alex. So people yeah, it's, uh, you. Yeah, it's openatlas.investments, uh, no.com, just openatlas.investments. Yep, that's our current offering right now. Great. All right, yep. link is in the show notes. Like I said, on financialsurvivalnetwork.com, make sure you sign up for your free newsletter. Alex, been a pleasure. Uh, we'll look forward to speaking with you again, and uh, good luck uh, through this tough environment. Appreciate you, sir. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.